Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Hi, and welcome, everybody. So in this episode of the Ancestral Health Today podcast, we have part two of our discussion with Daryl Edwards. In part one, we cover a number of his 12 pillars of health, including the benefits of sun exposure, sleep, movement, stress management, community, interacting within nature, and living slowly. Today, we'll dive into several other pillars of health relating to diet, avoiding toxicity, breathing, play, and living with purpose. Welcome, Daryl, again. Hi, again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, so last time we had a wonderful discussion and you introduced those pillars of health. Um, and we also were able to capture how so many of them are interrelated. Um, and today we're going to continue that discussion and I'll let you jump right in into where you want to get us started with. Yeah, I suppose um, probably moving to food. Uh, would be would be a good pillar to focus on um, for for many of us. Our gateway into a living an ancestral lifestyle was diet based. Um, for me, it was the, the paleo diet. For others, primal diet, uh, keto. There's carnivore. Um, there's a perfect health diet. There, there are there are many kind of flavors of of this base of ancestral diets. Um, I suppose what pretty much all of these diets uh, and approach to nutrition rely on, and so, you know, the word diet, the you know, original word diet comes from dieta, which is Greek, means lifestyle. So even though I'm using the word diet, there's a kind of a, a much broader scope when we are looking at the role of nutrition in, in one's life. Uh, so ancestral nutrition, one of the biggest pivotal uh, kind of um, turning points in relation to humans' reliance on food was a change from being hunter-gatherers, nomadic hunter-gatherers, to agriculture, the agricultural revolution. And that turning point meant we relied less on what we could hunt, gather, or scavenge to what we could grow, cultivate, and harvest. So we went from nomadic to more sedentary. We had land that we would reuse and repurpose for food. And so our food choices changed. Uh, so we had the livestock that we kept on cultivating for, for in terms of meat, but also dairy in terms of milk. And then we had a reliance on seeds. So grains became a, a huge feature of the agricultural revolution. And there are many um, epidemiologists, um, anthropologists who see that this turning point was one where we had a significant decline in human health. So for many, many reasons. But some argue that the introduction of foods of agriculture uh, or foods of civilization meant that there were also health issues as a consequence. So modern science gives us many of the potential reasons. So foods that increase the likelihood of inflammation, uh, of causing systemic inflammation. So foods such as grains, uh, contain compounds like lectins. So gluten is one is one uh, famous example of, of a lectin, which can cause irritation in the gut, acute inflammation in the gut. Um, some believe that can lead to longer term issues with the gut, such as leaky gut, and um, an impact of that chronic systemic inflammation can lead to chronic disease. Um, Foods such as dairy have also been linked to acute inflammation, have been linked to the fact that humans, um, as mammals, we should only be subsisting on dairy as babies, and usually our mother's milk uh, for, for dairy. So there's some who suggest that a, a separation from dairy, especially for, for adults, is a, is, is a good thing and, and can lead to, to, to health benefits. But there are also those who 
who say that uh, raw milk, for example, uh, goat's milk, um, is a really nutritious and healthful food. So I suppose that um, coming from that initial starting point of this separation between hunter-gatherer foods and foods of agriculture, there are many differences of opinion even when we enter this agricultural space. As we fast forward to the Industrial Revolution, where the processing of food and the kind of systemization of food processing became a thing, right? So these foods that were once grown, cultivated, harvested, um, became refined. So these processes, which meant faster food production, which meant greater turnover of food, more uh, production of food, also led to a reduction in nutrition and nutrients as we worked on different processes that may prov prolong life, food life, shelf life, but strip many of those foods from nutrients. And then if we jump again, leap again to the fast food revolution of the sort of 50s and 60s and 70s and right through to the present day where you have this ultra-processed food environment, um, that's probably where most people don't have any, there are no de debates there really as to what health of food is. So if we go from the hunter-gatherer where you had to work really hard to get your food to oftentimes not be successful in obtaining food to the industrial revolution where there's better access to food, um, better availability of food, but less healthful food options, and to the present day where food is pretty much just ultra-fast, ultra-processed, and we as humans have to make really difficult decisions around making food choices that deviate from the, the norm. So in one sentence, I would say ancestral an ancestral nutrition template is to eat less artificial, less processed foods, avoid refined sugars and grains, avoid uh, dairy, um, avoid intensely farmed produce. So intensely farmed meat, um, uh, farmed fish, focus on consuming good quality meat, uh, seafood, uh, vegetables, tubers, mushrooms, fruits, nuts, seeds, um, just eat real food. So that was a pretty long sentence, it was more like a paragraph, but I would say that is a great umbrella as to what we should be looking at as our sources of, of, of foods. And I mentioned the word eating less uh, rather than avoiding because there's room for flexibility there. Um, and as long as the majority of our food choices sit within that umbrella, um, there's, there is enough of a healthful dietary template to promote good health. So Daryl, you're mentioning this template, right? And you describe this evolution from hunter-gatherers through agriculture, through industrialized food. Um, but when People hear the term ancestral diet, immediately they also hear the word paleo, right? So paleo harkens back to what our paleolithic ancestors ate. And they might think of specific paleo diets like the ketogenic diet, carnivore diet, perhaps with some plants and tubers mixed in. So yes. um, is there one ancestral diet or does this template that you're describing embrace multiple options that you can customize or adapt? That's a very, that's a fantastic question. And, and I suppose it, 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 it kind of harks back a, a little bit to the original, my original definition of, of the ancestral lifestyle, which is we're trying to model the best of ancestral health practices. So for example, many of the foods that our, uh, our Stone Age ancestors ate aren't available to us today. <laughs> right that's that's for one so 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 um for us to kind of suggest that we can copy and we can have a template which is identical to our ancestors is flawed right there what we can do is model the cho the type of choices made so we know there are there was an uh, omnivorous selection 
of food choices for humans. Uh, we weren't just hunter hunters, right? <laughs> we were hunter gatherers. So for one, so there are many who will try and try and persuade us that we were just gatherer gatherers or gatherer hunters, and that the majority of our food intake was of vegetable matter, and hardly, you know, very rarely would we partake in animal foods. And there were some who would just say, actually, we hardly ever looked at, even looked at the vegetable or fruits. We just focused on eating meat and, uh, and fish if we could catch them. And that was, and that was it. Um, and, and, and I would say, like, any form of extreme, uh, um, this lifestyle should not be about extremes. Uh, and and even though balance can be overused, I, I would say for sure, if we look at this overarching umbrella of food choices, of real food choices, of less processed, non-processed foods, of avoiding artificial foods, of avoiding ultra-processed foods, uh, that would be the paleo template. Paleo is a bit of a dirty word now, <laughs> but but the principles many of those principles have become mainstream. So many people will go into a restaurant and request grass-fed steak. Uh, many people will recognize that they don't want hydrogenated fats um, uh, as, as part of their fat intake. Many people will, will toss up um, around healthier fats um, rather than less healthy fats, right? So omega-3 fats as our primary intake of fat rather than omega-6s, which are more pro-inflammatory fats, right? So, so many of those arguments, which for many started out in paleo-type discussions for nutrition, have become part of the mainstream. So even though I may not be using paleo as a term for my dietary choices, I certainly believe that this template is helpful is helpful for many. Um, and rather than us being very dogmatic about it, right, and trying to spread the, the kind of uh, tout the kind of gospel of good food, and it can only be this list of food choices and that's it, I would say we, sh we would be far better at shifting the perspective of saying, let's go back to spending time thinking about our food choices thinking about the food preparation, uh, recognizing that high calorie density, low nutrient density is never a good thing, <laughs> right? Recognizing that the more processing that occurs in foods is only likely to strip foods of nutrients. So if we, if we go back to those basic principles, that's the ancestral template, right? right there. Less about macronutrient choices, less about am I carnivorous, am I, you know, vegetarian. Um, that's what I would, that's what I would argue. And even though I've, I suppose I have given some opinion there, I would say if we do look at anthropolog anthropological evidence. So one of the best papers I saw about, probably about fi oh, 15 years ago, I could be misquoting here. There was a fantastic paper authored by Lauren Cordain several years after his book, The Paleo Diet, which looked at many hundreds of hunter-gatherers around the planet. And the great thing about that paper and looking at hunter-gatherer diets around the planet, there was basically kind of a bell curve distribution of, of food choices. So you had on the left the kind of highly carnivorous, mostly carnivorous hunter-gatherers. Then you had this broader spread of very omnivorous splits between animal and vegetable produce. And then you had at the other end uh, a higher vegetable intake. And, and that for me was, I was kind of sold. It was like, yes, there is a broad spectrum, but most of that spectrum is within this omnivorous dietary template. And even if we, we want to ignore that evidence, we just have to have a look at our physiology, right? So yes, we do have, um, you know, a gut, which 
enables us to be able to process meats as well as, as, well as vegetation. And we look at our mouths. We haven't just got like teeth that can cut into meat, right? We have molars that can also help to grind down food. We have hydrochloric acid in our stomach, low pH <laughs> that can tear through, you know, uh, muscle from meat. So, so we know we have this kind of omnivorous physiology, which gives us this uh, nutritional um, flexibility. Uh, and so even if we want to ignore any of the other arguments, if we look at our physiology, if we look at our GI tract, we can see what our bodies are capable of doing. So we evolved to process carbohydrates, fats, and protein. We have amylase. We have enzymes that break down carbohydrates. So for those who say, oh, well, why <laughs> we're not designed to, to consume carbohydrates? They're unhealthy for us. Why would we have two parts of our body in the mouth, in the pancreas, <laughs> that produce an enzyme that can break down carbohydrate, for example. That's right, Cheryl, on, so, on, that, on that point, and going back to the Cordain yeah. paper, he surveyed many populations. You mentioned different enzymes. There's individual, yes. there's variations between different um, ancestral cultures, right? So some have more or less amylase. Some people can tolerate, lac have lactase, some don't. Yes. So I guess... Going back to my question about multiple versus a single ancestral diet, should we pay attention to our, in, to our ancestry, our genetics, and can certain populations maybe tolerate different foods than others? How important is that? Or do you think that's really overdone and, and overemphasized? I, I would say it's, personally, I would say it's overdone. Uh, um, so one, we know genetically that we have far more in common genetically. Um, in all seven plus billion humans on the planet, then there are differences. Um, things like lactase uh, and lactose persistence, for example, right? We know most of that is cultural, so it isn't genetic. So if, you're, if you maintain exposure to, to lactase after the weaning period, you're more likely to be able to break down lactose as you, as you age. Uh, we know that populations that were exposed to, to to dairy for longer periods, such as the Northern Europeans, are better able to process milk. So part of it is, rel is relatively recent exposure rather than it being a genetic byproduct. So, so I, 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 you know, I would say it's, it's easy to get into the weeds and it's easy to be puritanical and it's easy to say, I know what's best. I would say it's better and safer for us to focus on the foods that we know without debate are the most harmful to us. And when I started my journey, the 80-20 rule, the Pareto rule, was, was kind of the, the, the thing to do. <laughs> you know, 80% of the time, you make ideal, you make the best food choices, and other times, you deviate from that. Um, and you main, hopefully can maintain a, a, a healthful dietary response in that, in, in that way. So unfortunately, especially in terms of nutrition, the nutritional science is very, very poor. So we know that it's very difficult to have randomized controlled trials. It's very difficult for us to isolate exactly from within food that gives us the benefit because most things work together. There's synergy in food, right? <laughs> so, you know, there are 10,000 phytonutrients in an apple, for example, right? And, and we don't know, we know about a handful of those phytonutrients and what their benefits are. We don't know about the other X thousands of them. We have those who will focus on antinutrients, right? So the antinutrients like leptins, like phytates, um, like the, the antinutrients that will absorb or block the absorption of nutrients that are important to humans, right? So there are those who will say, though lectate, lectins are the most problematic, phytates are the most problematic, oxalates are the most problematic. So there are many who will try to focus on one aspect of nutrition, one aspect of food and say, that's what's dangerous, that's what we should avoid and everything's okay. I would say it's far more nuanced than that. Um, and I think the consensus certainly is ultra-processed foods, nutrient-poor foods, <laughs> uh, 
energy dense foods without with poor nutrition, those are what are pro problematic. Highly refined foods, foods that are pretty much just sugar with no nutrients, those are, those are problematic. Um, the processing that's occurred to make foods like salmon, right? So if you have wild salmon versus salmon that's farmed, they're col salmon's colored pink. They've got to, they've got to try to, to, to make that food look as if it's, it's come from the wild. And in order to do so, they've got to play around with science to make that happen. Not great for our health. So I, I, you know, I know I'm kind of going from pillar to post on this, but, um, if we want people to embrace this lifestyle and to, to make healthier choices, we need to make this a sustainable choice for them. And, and we need to be able to motivate them to make healthier choices rather than them to literally take out, you know, have an encyclopedia on them as to what's, yeah. what's good and bad and what makes me a better person based on what's on my plate. And instead focus on what is going to fuel me to perform the activities that I need for the day, help to balance my mood and modulate my mood so I feel good about the foods that I'm eating. What can I eat that's going to help me celebrate with my peers and my family and friends and not feel, not have a guilt trip, not to become neurotic about my food choices. So, you know, if I can make a food choice, know that the majority of time it's going to be helpful for me, know that there's a lot of science backing it, which isn't a science in a silo, you know, it's pretty objective. Um, I feel that's a better, better place to be. So, so <laughs> I hope yeah, I got there, Todd. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great point. And that leads me to actually a two part question. So the first part is, um, we live in highly industrialized societies. So we are in the US, you're in the UK. Um, and we know that industrialized food is much more affordable. But the first mm. part of my question is in relationship to illness. Only 11% of people in the United States are metabolically healthy. So mm. how does that nuance play into the decisions that the public makes, makes when there is already a disease process like diabetes or pre-diabetes, high blood pressure, or even obesity, which is an indication that something is, you know, not working as it should necessarily. And then yes. the second part of the question is back to the affordability issue. Um, mm. Grass-fed beef is expensive and organic yes. produce is expensive. And we are in a period of inflation. Um, mm. And going to the grocery store a lot of times is, is painful for a lot of people at the moment. So how do we balance these principles, the new ones, not being neurotic about what we yeah. are choosing to eat and at the same time manage a condition and keep it affordable? I know that was a handful, but That's a, a mouthful. Handful. Yes. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's, let's go to the first. Both fantastic questions, by the way. So the first point. Um, you know, metabolic dysfunction, metabolic derangement. Um, yeah, as you say, a, gr a high percentage, whatever that percentage is, it's a very high percentage, especially in the US, right? So we know that the US kind of leads the way in, in metabolic dysfunction. So first issue I would say is everyone just tends to focus on diet being the issue. And of course, it's a significant part of the problem. But if we think about our lifestyle, then if we're sleep deprived, it's going to have an impact on our mm -hmm. metabolic dysfunction. If we're highly stressed, it's going to have an impact on our metabolic dysfunction. If we're not moving, which people don't seem to like to mention, but if we're mm -hmm. not moving, that's significantly increasing our metabolic dysfunction. So the US, the land of, of big cars, right? Cheap petrol or gas, even though you don't feel it's that cheap, right? <laughs> Air conditioned offices, uh, the work, work, work ethic, the sleep is for wimp wimps ethic, you know, uh, it leads to this environment of metabolic dysfunction. And so if you are trying to break the back of the problem of metabolic dysfunction, you've got to throw all the tools that, you know, that you have in a toolbox, 
And so whenever, I'm kind of dismayed in a way when people say the first thing you need to do is to sort out your diet, you know, and, and then you can, then you can sort out the other things. I would say better to moder- moderate improvement in several areas to make a far bigger holistic impact on one's health. Mm. And so if we realize, so for example, right, if I just, fo- if I focus on movement, right? So if I go for a walk after a meal, slow walk, 20, 30 minutes after my meal, and I am pre-diabetic or diabetic, right? Or have metabolic dysfunction. I can basically reduce my blood sugars to normal by going for that walk. Mm-hmm. Pretty much whatever I ate, right? <laughs> so, of course, if I make a better food choice plus go for a walk, then I'm going to be making even more impact to my blood sugars, right? But, yeah. but unfortunately, most people just say, oh, well, you know, you just have to cut your carbs and then that solves the problem. But there are so many ways to skin the cat of this problem, you know? So if I'm sleep deprived, I'm more likely to get up in the morning and want to make poor food choices because of leptin and ghrelin imbalances that occur from sleep deprivation, right? So if I move more, I'm going to become more insulin sensitive, which means I'm less likely to become insulin resistant. So even though metabolic dysfunction seems to be tied one-to-one with our food choices and the standard American diet, it isn't as simple as that. And I think we will make better inroads into this problem when we realize it's multifactorial, there isn't a silver bullet, and we need to use all the tools at our disposal, which are helpful, to help us tackle the problem. So that would be my answer for the first point. <laughs> and, and, I suppose, and I suppose the sicker we are, sicker one is, the more aggressive you may well need to be on some of those interventions, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, me going for a five-minute walk every day and saying I've got my movement in and, and I've got prediabetes, no, not going to help, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I'm going to need to do a lot of movement. Me deciding I'm, I'm just going to make a small change to my diet and I, I'm dealing with a metabolic disorder, no, not going to be good enough. You're going to need to be doing something very drastic to treat this as a therapeutic intervention. And hopefully then you can work to a place where you're in maintenance mode. Um, so, so I would say a lot of effort up front in lots of different areas, many of these pillars that we're discussing, um, and hopefully to a point where you can start getting into, into a maintenance phase where you, you don't have to be as strict <laughs> in many of those interventions, but you, you develop enough of a, a helpful habit and helpful patterns that it's easier to maintain. So, so um, that would be my, the first, my first kind of answer to the question. The second, in terms of food access, um, again, it, it's not a uniquely American problem, but certainly a huge contribution to, to these issues. So in America, you have these kind of like food deserts, right? Of what, like real food deserts where... It, it, it's you can be living in a community and the nearest real food item might be like 10, 15 miles away from where you live. There is no un- ultra processed food available in my locality. So whose fault is that? It's not the community's fault, you know, that that happens. There are bigger wheels, you know, t- at, at play. So, so, so I, I feel that, Rather than just looking at the individual, we have to start looking at more societal and more community interventions. And that way we'll have greater health, you know, like parity, um, health, health equity. Um, and then hopefully we can have better pricing so that people have, don't have to decide between real food, healthful food and whatever the cheapest, most processed food is. Uh, so, so yes, we need to be doing, we need to be doing far more. And, um, and of course I'm, I'm from the UK, so I don't want to sound as if I'm, I'm bashing the U S <laughs> but if the richest country on the planet by far, so, you know, you <laughs> the second place in, in te- you know, GDP per capita is so far behind, right? There is so much money available in American coffers. But what are the decisions made 
in terms of where that money goes. If a fraction, you know, like if half a percent of your defense budget <laughs> was spent on improving the lifestyle of your citizens, there wouldn't be food deserts, there'd be gyms everywhere, there'd be less reliance on medication, <laughs> there'd be better access to green spaces and, 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 and so on, uh, like there'd be better health education for your citizens. Um, lifestyle medicine would be the norm. So, so yeah, that's me getting and, on, off my, off my soapbox, but yeah. And it's pervasive yeah. too. I mean, even in the places where there is a lot of abundance and there is a lot of, um, you know, grocery stores or even farmer's market, the, the, con yeah. the addition of all the lifestyle factors, you know, how much people have to work and, um, how much, yes. how little community there is to have everything, um, done in conjunction so the responsibilities fall on the individual, it's easier and it is far cheaper sometimes to yes. order pizza on DoorDash than it is to, you know, grow, go to the grocery store, buy the food, then the time that it takes to prepare it and to, you know, by the time yes. that you're done preparing it and eating it, it's almost time to go to bed and now you want <laughs> yeah. to play your video game or just, you know... Um, just relax from the kind of day that you've had. And that's yeah. what, you know, U.S. citizens are going through for the most yeah. part. And, and that's a global problem, you know. So, so I would say if we go back to the hunter-gatherer, you know, uh, hunter-gatherers, right, what drove them to become agriculturalists? It was convenience, mm -hmm. right? Somebody decided, I've, I've, I've had enough hunting for food and not getting food when I want it, Right. I'm sick and tired of gathering food all day and just getting a handful of berries that somebody had those conversations, yeah. right? And somebody had the bright idea. Hey, let's just throw these seeds here. Hey, look at those cows. You look really friendly. Let's tame them and make sure we can keep them nearby and who instant food. So convenience is pretty much at the, the seat of our DNA, right? Convenience, ease of use, ease of an easy path to get whatever I need in life. And so we have to, in my opinion, there needs to be an environmental factor factored into this. So if we make our environment conducive to making things easier, i.e. it's easier to go to a supermarket and get these highly processed foods and pop them in a microwave and ding, and it's done and, you know, blend the food and it's easy, 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 easy. If, if that's, what we engineer into our lifestyles and, and, and if our DNA is telling us this is a really good thing, which it does, then we have to work really hard to step away from that. And it's the same with movement, right? It's the same with movement. Our environment is engineered to be sedentary. So it's very difficult to think about movement options. Well, why would I take the stairs when I've got this lift, this elevator here? Why? Same with sleep, right? Why do I, why should I go to sleep when I've got all this entertainment I can watch? When I've got these bright lights that are keeping me awake at night? So it, it, <laughs> we can't talk about this as individuals and, and blame ourselves for many of the, the, the choices that we're making. Many of them, unfortunately, are environmental. Many of them are very, very difficult to turn away from. And so you need a really strong, <sighs> work and self-determination ethic to be able to make many of those choices. And it's really hard. I wish it was easy. I would love to say it's an easy choice, but it's not. It's very, very difficult to live this lifestyle. There is nothing easy about it. It's easy for a month, 28 days, right? <laughs> it's easy when you read a book and you go, oh, my life has changed. But continuing that is very, very difficult. And, and so we need community. We need government intervention, in my opinion. Of the, of the correct type, <laughs> we need environmental changes that will make some of those cho those choices easier. You know, if we can subsidize, you know, at the end of the day, if we can subsidize certain foods, right, and have you know mountains of foods stored away, I'm sure we can subsidize fresh fruit and vegetables. I'm sure we can subsidize farmers to produce more livestock that's not factory intensively farmed, right? But we have to. Somebody has to decide. <sighs> what's important for us uh, as, so Darryl, as humanity. You, yeah. Yeah. You, you've, you've mentioned that it's a 
about a lot more than food, right? It's the whole environment. Uh, yes. it, it's also about movement. And we touched a little bit on movement in the in part one. But there's another aspect coming back to this convenience mindset where we compartmentalize movement into an exercise program, going to the gym. Yes. You've talked a lot about play. You have a whole program on this. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear a lot more about that. But going back to the ancestral theme, what's the connection mm. between play and our ancestors? Could you start there? And then how do we incorporate this into the modern environment? Yeah. So, I mean, play is common to all humans. It's common to all mammals. It's common to all animals. <laughs> right. So we have ludic genes. We have play genes that are part, that are part of us. So children aren't taught how to play. You know, the youngest of babies will blow bubbles and smile at the, the fact that they're blowing bubbles, right? With their mouth, right? So, so there is something which is, it's something that's part of our nature. And if we look at hunter gatherers, and we look at their, them celebrating success, it's in a playful way, right? So it's like, yeah, we've got some food. Let's, let's celebrate. Let's dance. Let's, we have these rituals that are really important, which are, again, based on this play framework. framework. So many of the feel-good hormones that we have, like dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin, all of these feel-good hormones, they're, they're activated through a playful spirit. They help humans connect, to communicate, to become better at their day-to-day -day tasks. So we became better hunters through playing more, <laughs> right? So kids model adult behavior, right? So they do what they see adults doing, and, and in turn, they improve their function to be able to do what adults do. So, so there are so many benefits to, to play. Um, and in the modern world, there's a significant amount of play deprivation. So now we see play as just for kids, and that time of kids' play has been reduced to the point where it's almost non-existent. So, you know, for, for all of us here, we had childhoods of like a significant amount of play. The majority of my day as a kid outside school was play. During the summer holidays, play. Parents hardly saw us. Get outside the house, play. Just don't get up to any mischief. Come back when it's time to eat. That food went down so quickly down my gullet because I wanted to get back out and play. Play, 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 right? And there comes a point in time when you're told, play, no, 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 no more time for play. Now you've got to focus on work. And that leads and bleeds into our adulthood. So we have a very serious, very stressful approach to life as adults. And any forms of play that we seek tend to be very detrimental. You know, gambling, <laughs> you know, let's go drinking, let's go partying, let's go, you know, that, that tends to be our playful celebration rather than the innocent form of play that we had as kids. So for me, with uh, having this focus of, on play and especially active play, one is it helps me to get more movement in my day because I'm, I've got a smile on my face often rather than a grimace when I'm moving more. And secondly, it helps to fire all of these feel-good hormones that we have. So for many people, having a more playful approach to life, whether that's with, with physical activity or in other areas, is beneficial. So that's why play is one of my 12 pillars. I've seen that you go into schools and you actually have to teach kids how to play, which is really sad, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it, so... I mean, that's sad, but how do you get adults into this, what you're talking about play? I mean, our days are so harried. We have little yeah. time. What kinds of things could you recommend just as um, starting points? Go to my website. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> go to promoplay.com. But, but in all seriousness, like we all know what it's like to play. And if we, if we go into work on a Monday morning, say, and we ask our colleagues, how was your weekend? Most of the time they'll talk about what they did that was fun, right? So, hey, we went on a hike at the weekend. It was incredible. We, you know, we, we went to, to, um, to Disney World with our, with our kids. Incredible, right? So, so 
we don't need to be convinced of the importance of play. And of course, it can help if children <laughs> are involved because it's easier for us to switch on this, this kind of playful state. But we all, we're all seeking it. Um, we're all, we're all searching for it. And I feel this level of play deprivation that exists now that permeates society that, that us as adults are affecting and impacting our kids. So, you know, when we say, when, when you mentioned I had to go into school to teach kids to play, why is that? It isn't because of kids. It's because of adults. It's because adults have decided one play should be deprioritizing for kids. There should be a better, more focus on academics. That's one problem. Two, there's a helico helicopter parenting focus now of, you know, more supervision. We want to see where they are. We want to know what they're doing. We don't want free range kids doing what, getting up to mischief. We don't want that happening. I want to know what they're doing at all times. And thirdly, our institutions like schools are set up to make sure that happens, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, kids have to be taken on a school bus to school or transported to school by by adults. If they go on play dates, it's playing with other kids, but supervised by adults. If they're doing any physical activity, it tends to be supervised by adults, by coaches, because that's what they should be doing for physical activity. And play has just been dialed down. So by the time we get to adults, many of us, you know, well, I would exclude myself from that, but many adults are really struggle to, to enter that play space to access their inner child. It, it seems so long ago. And so what I would suggest is just use your play history, go back in time and remember how good it felt playing whatever games you did as a kid and think about how you can recreate some of those or some of that feeling as an adult. And that's what I try and do with the primal play method is try to recreate that feeling. And the more we do that, hopefully the more you're going to want to continue doing that. So for me, I realized that I hated exercise, but I loved movement. And I realized that movement that many people choose to do didn't excite me. So me going on a hike, mm, no. Me going for a lengthy walk or a run, mm, no. For me, yeah, climbing a tree, that's fun. Balancing on railings, fun. Playing tag, fun. <laughs> Me creating scenarios when I'm walking down the high street to beat people and bob and weave between people, fun. So I dictate what is fun. I dictate what is playful. And I try to pull in as many playful opportunities as possible. And it helps me to move more. It helps me to be a nicer person. <laughs> it helps me to better relate to people. Um, helps people to think I'm a nicer person than maybe I am. But but at least they get to see my playful spirit rather than the serious, I'm down, isn't life bleak, work. <sighs> Do you know what I mean? Can't wait to get in the office on Monday. Can't wait to leave the office. Can't wait to sleep. That's my week in, week out. Isn't life fantastic? Well, for me, it wasn't. So <laughs> So life still can be mundane and routine. But we can throw in a little bit of pro, you know play every now and again, like a good kind of seasoning um, to have more play opportunities in our in our life. Yeah, and play is also about creativity, right? Um, kids' games. Yep. you're making stuff up. It's make believe. Um, it's, yep. it, it's, exactly. It's giving you that it's, that joy, right? Uh, it's being bored. So you know, we don't yeah. want our kids to be bored now, right? So and I remember many times being told. I'm bored. I tell my parents I'm bored. It's like, amuse yourself, find something to do, <laughs> right? Whereas now we know that parents will say, okay, here you go. Here's something you can do. Here's the smart device. Here's a television program. Here's something that you can do that's going to stop you being bored. So people don't know how to daydream anymore because if a kid daydreams, it's problematic. We see it as a problem, right? We say they're on the spectrum. Right. You know, it's like it, it's it's it, it's incredible how how much has changed in the last generation or two. Um, so, yeah, I feel privileged and honored to be able to have a childhood that I did in terms of being a free range kid, active play kid. All the kids in my neighborhood had, had the same sort of experience. <laughs> yeah. And we're, um, we're raising kids yeah. to be sedentary adults. 
because they yeah, exactly. are being sedentary throughout their lives. And the more that you cultivate that lifestyle, the more difficult it is to do something alternatively. Ab about yeah. it, yeah. And, and if we're modeling that as adults, right? So if they see it, if they see that as adults, they're like, yeah, that's what adulthood is about. Mm -hmm. And now there isn't much of a distinction between the two. So when I was a kid, there was like the adults are doing the adult stuff. Couldn't care less what they're doing. <laughs> they're not having a good time. We're having a good time. But now many kids are thinking, oh, the adults are having all the fun, all that time on their screens. They, you know, like <laughs> that's what, how we're, re we're programming a childhood's mind to be thinking about adulthood right? Being sedentary, coming back from a gym going, oh, I'm so sore. Oh, it was so awful. Oh, oh. you know, okay. Ex exercise isn't fun, is it? No, it's really hard work. It's just about being sore. Don't like that. Yeah. I'll just stay in my armchair and watch TV playing my, my computer games. So, so this is the, this, this is the world that we're, an environment that we're creating one for ourselves, secondly, for our kids and for our kids, there's even an even worse impact because it isn't there. It really isn't their fault. <laughs> you know, um, we should be doing, we should be doing better. So yeah, that's why I do the work that I do. Um, and when I do go and t teach kids how to play, to be f honest, I'm really trying to encourage the adults to reconsider how important play is for the kids. So that's really what I'm really, what I'm trying to do is to kind of like a bit of misdirection, and say, hey, can you see how much fun the kids are having and not being told all these rules and giving them a bit of freedom? Can you see how great this is for kids and they're letting off steam? And we now have this research which tells us that kids can perform better academically by having more of those <laughs> play breaks, right? Um, by taking them out of the, that stressful state all the time, they're actually performing better. They're more emotionally intelligent. They're less likely so to be that bullies. So another yeah. pillar that you mentioned that sort of takes us out of the stressful state is breathing deeply. Uh, yes. Th that's an interesting one because a lot of people just assume we all know how to breathe, right? Are you telling me how to breathe? What is it about breathing or changing the way we breathe that can come and, back? And doesn't that stress? breathe also occur yeah. when you're, you know, doing, when you're playing, you know, you're yeah. having much yeah. more of that you know, bringing that into your life as well. So everything, yeah, like you said, is sure. interconnected. Everything is interconnected. So yeah, for sure. So we know there is a focus on, on breath and breath work. And, and, you know, most of us take shallow breaths all the time. But the reason why many of us take shallow breaths all the time is because we're sedentary. That's why. Because if I went for a sprint for the bus, <laughs> there is no, there is absolutely no way I'm just going to be breathing with my chest and shallow breathing. Not going to happen. My body's going to say to me, hey, Daryl, you need far more oxygen than what you're delivering to me now. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so yes, we have this focus on breath. We know that if we take time to inhale, to exhale, if we breathe deeply, there's this parasympathetic response. There's a relaxation response. We're bringing the heart rate down. We can reduce blood pressure. We can promote relaxation. Um, we can reduce stress, right? So, so I think one of the beauties of the, of the thinking about this ancestral lifestyle is are these cycles that, that occur and this kind of amplitude that exists. So we shouldn't just be staying in this shallow breathing state right? We should be breathing appropriately for our, for the oxygen demand that we need. So that's what I feel we should be doing. So we should breathe deeply enough to sustain ourselves at the point that we need. So if I'm sedentary and I have time to focus on breathing deeply and I want to enter this kind of meditative relaxed state, then that's what I should do. If I'm sprinting <laughs> and recovering from the sprint, then I should be focusing on breathing deeply <laughs> to get my heart rate down. If I need to perform an activity for an extended period of time, I need to be focusing on a breathing pattern that will help me to sustain that activity for a certain duration. So breath is really important, of course. Oxygen is really important. 
um, again, if we look at our physiology, there are some people who will say, you should only ever breathe in through the nose. You should never breathe in through the mouth. And there's all these reasons why the nose is far better as a vessel for channeling air into the body, right? But of course, we have like this secondary backup, right? It's like, yes, nose should mainly be used. But if you go for a max effort sprint, you're not going to be breathing in through your nose. <laughs> you're going to be using your mouth. You're going to be trying to fill your lungs. Your diaphragm is going to be engaged. You're going to be doing everything you can to get oxygen in. So there's a, there, there is a step, step change. <laughs> there's a, there's a basically a, a gradient of oxygen need based on the activity we're doing. And the outcome determines what our breathing response should be. So slow my heart rate down. I want to be more relaxed. I want to be more parasympathetic. Or I want to be sympathetic. I want to be going all out. And I will do anything I can to take oxygen in because oxygen at this point is fuel for, for me. So I hope that kind of explains that pillar of, of, of breathing and why it's extremely important. I think it does. Are there practices that we can learn that will, you're talking about integrating into ordinary life, but are there breathing practices that occasionally can help us control stress or um, modulate health in other ways? Yeah. I mean, I suppose if you determine that you are, you only have a mouth breathing, for example, um, then there are practices such as, you know, taping, taping your mouth, being more focused on, on nasal breathing. Um, there are apps that will tell you what your respiration rate is per minute. So, you know, if you're respiring like 30 times per minute, that's too many, especially if you're sedentary. <laughs> so, so you can find out how many times per minute you should be breathing in and out. And then you can try and work to slow that down to a rate which is the norm. Um, of course, if you have any issues with lung function, um, if you have conditions which means you have poor lung functions, then you may need to change to change that. So it depends on your starting point. It depends on what the, the issue is. Um, and it depends how much work you need to do to train yourself either to do more nasal breathing, either to do more diaphragmatic breathing. So many of us just breathe into the chest. Um, but if you really want to take a deep breath, you've got to involve the diaphragm. So diaphragmatic, diaphragmatic breathing is a really good practice. I use that a lot. Um, I sometimes will mirror movement patterns with my breathing pattern to also help st to stay relaxed, even though I'm doing something very vigorous. So those would be a, those would be a few practices which are uh, fairly easy to implement. Wonderful, Daryl. And we have covered um, a lot of the pillars and we've talked about how they all interconnect and how we need to be, you know, looking at multiple um, points in our lifestyle uh, choices and the changes that we need at a system level, which I think has really helped uh, bring it all together for the audience. Um, is there anything else, any of the pillars that we have missed or anything else that you would like to say to tie them all together? Yeah, yeah. So living purposefully, and I, I suppose being on this podcast, having uh, yourself, Isabel and Todd, as wonderful hosts, right? This is part of our purpose. This is one of the reasons, I know there are many, but this is one of the reasons why we get up in the morning. It's, it's what can I, what can we contribute to the world around us, whether that's to our peers, to our community, to our friends, family. Um, it's taking what you're most passionate about and thinking about how I can continue to do this, how I can continue to live this way, and how can I do something which changes other people's lives, not just my own. And we know that those who live with purpose are more likely to live longer, to live longer with health. Uh, to less to be less likely to suffer the issues of social isolation and and being alone um 
And it also helps to reduce stress <laughs> because you have a focal point rather than kind of constantly being distracted. You're like, I have a mission, I have a purpose, and it doesn't have to be overly ambitious. It just has to be purposeful. It has to be actionable. It has to be something which is well-defined for you and it's meaningful for you and it's likely to drive action. So one of my purposes is promoting movement that's playful. <laughs> and I suppose I spend my time trying to spread that to everyone I meet <laughs> and without embarrassment because that's who I am. And I held that aspect of myself back for so many years of my adult life, working in a very high powered investment banking technology background and everything was serious. And one of the turning points for me was being called into my boss's office because my colleague and I were laughing at the water cooler and we almost got fired <laughs> because my boss was like, you're not here to be laughing or smiling, having a laugh and a joke with your colleagues. You're here to make the bank money, to help the bank make money. And, and that was, thank goodness I had that conversation because I realized then I wasn't living with purpose. I was just pushing myself to one side because of this financial reward. But at the end of my life, I'm not going to be thinking about how much money I made whilst working in that bank. Um, I'm want to be focusing my, on my memories, on the cherished memories that I had with others uh, and, and the times that I will never be able to recreate <laughs> and what I want others to say about me at the end of my days. So that for me is my, is my purpose. I think that's a great way to wrap up uh, a wonderful discussion. And I can tell you, you do achieve your purpose, uh, Daryl. Uh, I've attended your movement sessions at Ancestral Health Symposium, and we're sitting there in this room, cold, dark room, listening to all these lectures. And then the, your play session comes up and it's everybody looks forward to it and you bring brightness into our lives. And I know you do it with the folks you coach and children and whatever. And that, that's got to be uh, uh, rewarding too you know, to, to see how the impact that you have on others. So I think that that's a really key point. And uh, thank you for helping to sort of introduce the, the podcast and the audience to this range of health pillars, which is really broad. And, you know, I think a lot of people come into this just thinking about food, but it's so much more. I don't know, Isabel, you know, what do you, what do you think? What yeah, you, I definitely echo that. Um, you bring a lot of play, but also compassion and nuance to this space, understanding that everybody is starting at a different point. Um, and I think that is that makes a big, big difference from, you know, some of what we tend to see with, you know, it's either one way or the other. I think that mm. your audience can really relate to the fact that you acknowledge the struggles and um, that you integrate the play into those struggles from wherever people are. And we really thank you and are very glad that you're part of this community as well. Oh, thank you. You're far, far too complimentary. Um, and I suppose just to recap, I'm going to quickly run through in a very playful way. <laughs> <laughs> the 12 pillars, follow the sun, live slowly. I should, say, I should have said that more slowly. Live slowly. Interact with nature. Sleep deeply. Deeply. Uh, manage stress appropriately. Avoid toxicity. Eat naturally. Engage your community. Really important, that one. Breathe deeply. Live purposefully. Move naturally. Remember that one. And finally, play wholeheartedly. Amazing. Thank you so much, Daryl, for being with us today. Thank you so much. And just for uh, folks who want to check out uh, a little bit about what you're doing, where can they go? Yeah, my website is called primalplay.com, uh, where you can find out a lot about moving playfully, uh, influencing others around you to move more playfully. 
I have a book out called Animal Moves for Adults and My First Animal Moves for Kids. And uh, for a big picture overview of what I do, my TED Talk, Why Working Out Isn't Working Out. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Daryl. And thank you, Todd. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health Today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.